sometimes after I've given a Dhamma talk, a person will come up and say, I wish so-and-so had been here to hear this. And the thought that immediately comes up in my own mind is, well, where did you hear this? We're here to train ourselves. The Dharma is a mirror for us to look at ourselves at. The image that the Buddha gives in the canon, there are actually two of them. One is of a young man or woman, fond of adornment, looking in a mirror and checking his or her appearance. The person sees a blemish, okay, you want to get rid of the blemish. There's no blemish, then you can take satisfaction that you look good. Of course, here we're not concerned about looking good. Our mirror here is our actions. That's the image the, the Buddha gives to Rahula. In other words, our actions in through our body, through our words, through our thoughts. How would they look if you looked at them in a mirror? What shape would they have? How many blemishes would they have? And what could you do to get rid of the blemishes? That's what we're here for. Now our problem is, of course, is that our eyes point out. They don't point in very much. And so we're seeing other people's actions. But there's a way of using them as a mirror, too. If you see someone do something that's really ugly to look at, you can ask yourself, do I do that? If you see them doing something that's really admirable, you can ask yourself, can I do that? In other words, keep referring things back to your own thoughts, words, and deeds, straightening them out, and using the Buddhist standards. It's all too easy when you're looking in the mirror to say, okay, I look okay for today. And the question is, whose standards are you using? It was a comic strip that was famous in Thailand years back, and it's still well known. It's, it's the Japanese comic strip, Dornaman. And there's one of the episodes in which Nobita, who's very plain looking, switches bodies with Shishuka, his, the girl that he's aspiring toward. She looks at herself in the mirror with this new body. She says, aren't, aren't you ashamed of yourself to go around like this? We're used to looking at our face and seeing it every day, every day, and it becomes perfectly okay, perfectly normal. But there are people who would be ashamed to go around with your face. Of course, in terms of external looks, there's something wrong with those people. But try to think of your actions in the same way, and then it's a different story. If the Buddha looked in his actions and saw what you're doing, what would he think? I mean, he gives standards, so you know. It starts with the precepts. Let's take right action, for example. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex. I've been talking recently to people who are surprised to find out that there are moral absolutes in the Buddhist teachings. Everyone thinks, seems to think that moral absolutes are blind and simplistic. Well, the Buddha wants things to be kept simple, because our mind is so complex, and if you start trying to introduce complexities into these issues, all kinds of defilements can sneak into the corners. You can give reasons for killing, you can give reasons for stealing, you can give reasons for illicit sex. We have the spectacle now of a famous Buddhist monk saying that <clears throat> there are times when killing is okay. Well, you look at his reasons, and you begin to wonder what, what kind of defilements is he hiding? through his reasonable rhetoric. The same goes with all the other precepts, the precepts against lying, harsh speech. The lying, though, is the big one. There are times the Buddha says a harsh speech is okay, but lying, no. In fact, of all the precepts, that's the one he seems to take most seriously. And of course, there's the precept against taking intoxicants. And these are clear-cut standards. And these are the standards that when 
against which you measure actions as you look in the mirror. These descriptions of concentration are also meant for you to look at your mind and see how it measures up. There are only four jhanas. John Lee has a great comment. He says, there are only four jhanas. There are people out there who take charge of corporations and farms, thousands of acres, lots of people. And here we only have four jhanas to look after. We still can't figure them out. So these are standards against which we can measure our thoughts, words, and deeds and see where we're lacking, see where we have blemishes, see what needs to be fixed up. And that's what we should busy ourselves doing, is looking at our thoughts, words, and deeds, not going around looking at other people, trying to get them to fit into our, our standards that we've picked up from the Buddha. This is one of the reasons why people don't like moral absolutes, is because other people try to impose them on them. We're not trying to impose them on anybody else. We're offering them as a training. We train by this, and we learn that we benefit from it. And anyone else who seems inclined, we're happy to encourage them. So make sure your standards are clean, clear-cut, and you really are diligent in looking at yourself in the mirror this mirror of Dhamma. Don't let yourself get away with dressing shabbily or not combing your hair or not taking care of those blemishes. In other words, if you see something in your actions that's not up to standard, do what you can immediately. The same with your words, the same with the state of your mind. We don't have much time. And particularly, we don't have a lot of time to go around looking at other people. Aside from what I just said, which is that look at them as examples. Are they a good example? Okay, what can you do to live up to that good example? If they're not a good example, ask yourself, okay, do I have that? When each of us is looking after him, his or her own appearance in the Dharma mirror, there's not much conflict, not much reason for conflict. Because after all, where does, where does conflict come from? It comes from a kind of thinking the Buddha called babancha, or objectification. Sometimes you hear babancha as meaning just thoughts going out of control. But that's not what he's talking about. It's our way of looking at things where we define ourselves, I'm this this way and I'm that that way, and in order to maintain our identity that we take on. As the, the thinker of these thoughts. We have to lay claim to part of the world. Well, other people have their part of the world. And we find other people in our world, and we want them to fit into our ideas of what the world should be, and that creates all the trouble we see all around us. So to start getting rid of that kind of thinking, you look inside to see where these troublemaking thoughts come from, because they cause trouble not only for other people, but a lot of trouble inside. So much so that a lot of people don't even want to look at themselves in the Dharma mirror. But we're not like that. We want the, our appearance and our thoughts, words, and deeds to be really worth looking at, something we can take pride in. Pride is not always an unskillful emotion. It's one of the motivations the Buddha recommends for getting on the path, for engaging in right effort. You know, the pride of a craftsman, the pride of someone who has mastered a skill. So that when you look at your skill, that's the mirror you're looking into. You say, okay, I can do this well. And then you continue with your training. So you look better and better and better in the Dharma mirror. That's how we use the Dharma in the correct way.